Church family, I just want to lift your spirits today with the concept of transparency is what I want to examine. Question mark. Love it. Transparency. I do want to apologize uh, to Elder Hoffman and to you. I, I gave him the scripture reading that I had to research, but I'm not dealing with that whole chapter. I'm only dealing with one narrative. And I noticed that when we were reading it, maybe some of you were bewildered, especially with the third narrative. Why were they eating their children? Etc. like that. And now I feel like I have to explain uh, the, the, that. I can do it in one minute. You may have questions afterwards. You can see me after. But the whole chapter has three narratives. I'm only dealing with one. And it's the second narrative, the one that we are most familiar with. Remember when we started reading about how Elisha um, um, told the young man there's more with us than against us and everyone started getting excited. I'm dealing with that narrative. Okay. But the chapter has three different narratives. Yes. The first one is, as we know, the floating accent. That's one narrative. Mm -hmm. The second one is the one I want to deal with, with the Syrian army coming and Elisha telling the young man, listen, you don't have to be afraid. There is more on our side then is on theirs. Ours is on scene. And we get excited about that. I want to deal with that. But the third one is a consequence. If you remember the story of the second one that we read, after Elisha took them down and they actually found themselves in Samaria, he fed them. He didn't hold them captive. Remember that? Once he fed them and let them go, the king of Syria was upset. So Syria took their whole army and ransacked Israel and put them under siege. And if you're under siege, what they do is they stop food from coming in to your territory. After a while, you know, you can only eat so much veggie links. After the veggie links are gone and the vegetarian beans are gone and you kill up all the cows you made, after a while, it could be a two year, three year siege, after a while you have no more food. And when you have no more food, what then do you eat? According to the text, According to the text, at that time, people, they were not only, if you read it carefully, they were eating pigeon dung. Wow. They were eating their children wow. oh, yeah. because they were under siege. And what happened to Elijah is a fascinating. Now, maybe we'll do this another time. But if you read the stories, if you accept them as chronological, it's, a, it's fascinating how Elijah first is so confident. But by the time you get to that third narrative, they are blaming Elijah for this. You did this to us. King who was once friends with Elisha saying, no, no, you did this to us. And at the end of the story, you see Elisha, it depends on who you think the verb is, and now that's another conversation. Is it the king who makes a statement or Elisha? But then Elisha says, I believe it's Elisha, Elisha says, at the end of it, amazingly, he says that this is all from God. And it's a long, you know, we can deal with that another time. So that's, that's the explanation, church family. Uh, but I, 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 uh, I accidentally gave Ella Hoffman the whole chapter. It was only 8 through 23. Amen. Amen. But hey, at least you guys got some new biblical knowledge today. Amen. Amen. And you go study on that third narrative. It's very exciting. But today, I just want to deal with the second narrative. That's verses 8 through 23. And what I want to do, church family, is I... Excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. I want to underscore... I want to underscore... A couple verses. So please, you take your Bibles. Let's go to 2 Kings. And I want to underscore this because I'm not going to go through the whole narrative again. I just want to underscore two verses. 2 Kings 11 through 12 as I'm talking about transparency. 2 Kings 11, I'm sorry, 2 Kings 6, 11 and 12. Just those two verses. Just those two verses. Are you with me? All right. There... It says, the writer says, and you, we read this already, but just for emphasis. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Which one of you, which one of you are, are, are telling my business? Verse 12 says, and one of his servants said, None of us, my lord, none of us are engaged in treason. None of us are telling your business, O king, but it is Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the word that you speak in your bedroom. All right, that's what I want to deal with. And just for a wider context, because many people don't understand that text, so I'm going to read this to you to give you some explanation on that text. 
It's what's found in 1 Kings 20, verse 28. And then I'll bring it together. 1 Kings 20, verse 28. It says, Then a man of God came and spoke to the king of Israel and said, Thus says the Lord, Because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore, I will deliver all this great multitude into your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Those two texts come together. Many people don't understand uh, how, or, or I shouldn't say how, but maybe don't understand 2 Kings 6, 11, and 12. So I read that text to help you as I make the point of this concept of transparency that I want to deal with. Maybe it's a little bit overrated. I don't know what you think, but we're about to find out. Maybe it's overrated. Second Kings, let me just stay there. Maybe it's overrated. Transparency, question mark. Father, we ask for understanding as we look to your word in the name of Jesus. <coughs> Amen. 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 Church family, church family. I want you to know about wiretapping and surveillance. I want you to know about that. Wiretapping and surveillance in any of its forms, whether it's signal, whatever it is. Wiretapping, surveillance, and any other uh, synonym you want to use to describe that. These concepts are used to find out, as you know, find out information that is intended to be private. Wiretapping, secret surveillance, any other synonym, it's used to find out information that the subject intends to be private. I want to let you know that people do it against people. Yes. It's not difficult in, in today's age. You can go down to Best Buy and some of these other places and find technology to do it. We know of reports where people break into people's homes. Mm -hmm. They don't want to steal anything, they just put up cameras so they can look and listen. Not I mean, People do it to people, it's a crime. People do it. People can take it from your cell phone. I'm not, we're not even talking government. People can do it. Simple. Send you something on the, uh, on the email, you pull it up off your cell phone, and now they have access. They can read all your texts, everything like that. What you intend to be private, read it like it's an open book. On their cell phone, on their computer. We know people do this government against citizen. You remember after 9-11 when we found out it was all big, it's all big news, and we found out that the government was involved, was in bed with the telecommunication companies, you know, AT&T, Verizon, all in bed, and that they were harnessing the information if they felt necessary off your phones. They would snatch it in the middle of the air. You call them pastor, the pastor, guess what? And they snatch it, they listen to boom. Because they're saying they're looking for terrorist activity. Then they start talking about they go through the FISA court, you know, and all that kind of stuff. We didn't care. We were upset. We were like, no. How are you looking and listening to our own phones? You know, they got it to where, of course, you know, on your laptop where there's a camera. You know, everybody likes to, likes to uh, look at their camera. They get, they get tired of their phone. They put it down and pick up the laptop. And they're on the camera. They can access your camera. And it can be on and you not turn it on. And if you leave your, if you leave your laptop up and you walk around, they can see you. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Government does it against a citizen. We were, the, we were upset. No, 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 no. You can't do that. Intelligence community. U.S. intelligence community. You're listening to my calls. You're looking at me. Government, they do it to friends. Yeah. Government does it to friends also. Remember uh, WikiLeaks under the Obama administration, the, 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 the WikiLeaks dump that came? When we found out that the Obama administration was wiretapping a uh, German chancellor. Remember that? It's supposed to be allies. You on tap. German Chancellor, we know what you're talking about. We fixed it up with our friends. We fixed it up, but we are doing it. Government do it against enemies. Oh, we know that one, right? China is taking information out of Sony. Russia now under DNC. And both countries say that we do it to them. You know, we don't talk about it from our perspective. But you go to those countries, they tell you the U.S. does it all the time. U.S. will enter our system, do it all the time. Listen, I want to give you a newsflash, ladies and gentlemen. Newsflash. It is not news 
That information is being stolen. It's not used. Now people get embarrassed when they find out, but it's not used. It's been there for decades. It's just embarrassment. It's not used. We do it, listen, that is the whole purpose of having an intelligence community. What do you think they're there for? They're there to access information. Now we say it for our interest, but that's what we're there. All the big governments have it, that's what we do. The question I'm posing is, why don't we like it? Why does it make us uncomfortable if we are the subject of it? We say, what I hear, I hear people say this, I love transparency. <laughs> Businesses come out and they say we're going to be very transparent. Obama administration said they're going to be the most transparent administration ever. I, on Southwest, they try to be so transparent, they have a term called transparency. Have you guys seen that? Yeah, right? Everybody wants to be trans. It's the big word. You need to be transparent. You need to be transparent. Transparency is overrated. Do you really want transparency? Because it will reveal things that we don't want people to know. Is that what you want? Someone made that argument. I don't think you really want to know. Do you really want that transparency? And would you want it for yourself? Can we be that transparent? Because if that's the case, what's the big deal about wiretapping and surveillance? What's the problem? We're all transparent. I want you to see as I am. You can read everything on my, on my cell phone. No, you can't. No, you can't. No, you can't. But uh, let's be transparent. In our text that we just read, in my experience, when I hear the text talk about, mostly it's talk about verses 14 through 20. Which again, we got excited when we saw it on the screen and we read it because it feeds our faith. We're talked about how Elisha, the veteran now, he was commissioned as the follower of Elijah. And he's there with this young man and the Syrian army is surrounding them. And the young man is scared. He's discouraged and he has fear. And Elisha, calm and cool and collected, he tells them, listen, I know you see a lot of people. But there is more on our side than it is on theirs. And then you, you take that theological point and they love to run with it. And it speaks to our faith that the unseen is more powerful than the seen. That God is for us. That no matter the situation that you're in, no matter what it may look like, the unseen power is there. And, 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 and just, to, just to give this young man something that you will never forget. He asks God to show forth the unseen. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, man. What would that be like if we could just, in just one of our experiences in life, just one, that happened. You know, when you was up against something and you were scared and nervous, and then just the Lord was like, you know what? I'm going to do this for you. Just like I can do for the young man, I'm going to do it for you. And he brings to light so you could see what was unseen. Oh, that would encourage the faith like never before. That's what happens here, and that's what's mostly talked about in that, in that narrative. And it's powerful. I understand. It's powerful. I like to look at it. When I'm in situations, I say, Lord, help me. Give me that eyesight, that faith eyesight, that I know that you're on my side. Because what I'm seeing, I cannot surmount, but with you, I can. It's not always talked about how Elisha, I don't know what you call this, some people call it a lie. Elijah lied to them and said, no, I'm going to take the man that you're looking for. Knowing that they're looking for him. That's right. Yeah. Straight out lied to the face. I know. We don't like that. That's, that's rarely talked about. We talk about that in the seminary. But it's rarely talked about. Elijah lied to their face. I'm going to take you to who you're looking for. Yeah. That's right. Come here. They're looking for JL. I asked God to inflict them with blindness. And it's not literal blindness. Or, or they couldn't follow Elijah all the way to Samaria. It is more of a bedazzlement, right? Inflicts him with that and say, I'm looking for jail. Ask God, boom! And then I take him all the way down to, to Fairfield. And then I say, I'm thinking, where, where are we going? I'm thinking to Fairfield so I can show you who jail is. Would you call that lying? <laughs> yeah. We didn't. That's very rarely talked about. Also, what's rarely talked about is the surveillance that's going on. In verse 11, 12, which I read for emphasis, What's that read for emphasis 
It lets us know that there's some type of wiretapping going on with the king. So much so that the king is troubled. He calls his people in and he seems like he wants to accuse them of treason. Somebody here is leaking my information. They use the word uh, bedchamber, bedroom. It's, it's a concept letting you know that in his most secret, it may not have been in his bedroom. He may have had a war room somewhere. But wherever it was, it was bedroom is to establish extreme secrecy. Gentlemen, I talked about our war plans in the secret room. We have blockage so we cannot, so they cannot do any signal intelligence. There's only 30 of us here. How does Israel know? One of you is talking. And treason is dead. Somebody's about to get killed up in here. <laughs> Somebody is. We see that. We see that. We, know, we see it today. We see that. I mean, Obama was very upset with leaks. Trump is irate with leaks. It's part of being a president. Somebody's leaking your information. And, and the king of Syria is upset. But then someone steps forward and they say, but, but oh king, none of us, none of us are doing it. Who is it? Elisha. Elisha's not here. He's not here. Elisha is doing it. Elisha knows what you are saying here and he's letting Israel know. What do you do with that? Right, it's there in the story, what do you do with that? That's why I read to you, what text was that? 1 Kings 20, 28. Because you understand that when you understand the wider context. In 1 Kings 20, 28, we read, we read that the prophet came to Ahab and said to Ahab, listen, remember, remember, over in our story, it's Syria. In 1 Kings, it's still Syria. The prophet goes to Ahab and he says, the Syrians think that our God only has limited power. They think that. And the prophet says to Ahab, because they think that, God is going to give you, King Ahab, as wicked as you can be, <laughs> King Ahab, a great victory. Now we have to understand the context. In this area of biblical times, peoples believe that gods had limit. So you had the God of the sky, all he did was deal with the sky. Right? God of rain? Pray for the rain, talk to this God. God of fertility? We got talking to fertility God. They had an understanding that God was limited in a particular narrow sense. Here, the Syrians thought that Yahweh was a limited God. That God's power was only locally. God had power so long he was in Vallejo. Outside of Vallejo, no power. They believe that. They lived in Sacramento, and they said, no, 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 no. Power is only in Vallejo. That's the God of Yahweh. That's the Israel God. The prophet tells Ahab, God wants to show them that he is limitless. In the battle of hearts and minds, he wants to let them know that his power is not just local. It is universal. Yes. He can do it all. He's not separated from fertility to rain to sky to only Vallejo. He wants them to know that. So now we go down and we see the Syrian king is sitting there telling secrets, war secrets. How can Israel know? They are miles away. How would they know? It is a demonstration that God is trying to say to Syrians that Yahweh is all powerful so much so that the things that you say in your bedroom chamber with you and one other person, I know. And I'm going to show you that I know. I'm going to take that information and I'm going to give it to Israel and they're going to act on it. He's demonstrating power to the Syrians. The theological question is, do we, in today's 21st century, think and act sometimes and maybe even wish that God actually had limited local power? Because oftentimes we present God as being only in one place. Come to Berea because this is where God is. No, he's here. But guess where else he's at? He's at the movie theater. 
Yeah, he's there. Yes, he's there. When you're out there hanging out, you got, you got Magic Magic Mountain right here? That's where he is. You roll down to the Matreon down to San Francisco, there he goes. You get on the plane and you fly out to London and you are just hanging out, he's there. This concept oftentimes, and we, and we see this, even in Ish, Israel had that problem. Israel was like, come to us, because this is where God is. When you get to the New Testament, New Testament says, go out. Let them know that God is out there. He's not, he's not in the tabernacle exclusively. He's not at only there when you have family worship. He's not only there, he is there. His power is universal. And in that way, we have to operate in that way. We have to let people know that the God, and we know it's like that. The other issue, the other issue is, and you know, we see that in, in, in not only that, but even in our prayers. Sometimes, and this is my experience and what I've been told by the people, is sometimes it's hard to speak to God in truthful ways. Because somehow you think he's not in your bedroom chamber. He's not in your mind like he doesn't know how you think already. That somehow you have been able to block him out like the king, like king of Syria. You think he's blocked out. He really doesn't know. Oh, Lord, I thank you. You are so good to me. When you actually feel that God is not good to you, you think he's unfair. That he's better to other people than he is you. But God, you're so Because you want to repeat what you hear people say and the, the, the feeling it has on you. So you say, Lord, you're so good. But your heart is saying, God, I don't even know if I trust you. You, I feel, has been unfair to me. Right? We treat God that way. Like the king of Syria. He, he really don't know. He knows. Amen. He knows. Everything. He knows when you got elements against somebody else. He knows. He knows when you really like him or you don't. He knows. Amen. And this understanding of the universality of God in both location and in our minds, and wherever you may be, is something I think as Christians we wrestle it, wrestle with in our spiritual maturity. We have to get to the point, like David, you know, David praying down curses on his enemy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you may have to do it publicly, but listen, you can do it in your bedroom chamber. Lord bless, bless you, mad as can be. Lord bless. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> be with them. And I and, uh, just help me. Be, be with them. That's not the prayer you want to say. That's not what you want to say. <clears throat> he can read you in the bedroom chamber. Lord, burn them up. <laughs> you get them, Lord. You get them and let them know that you're on my side, that you're not on their side. That what they did was wrong. Lord, curse them. And you can do that. You can do that. He knows you're thinking of it already. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No need to lie. No need to lie. Amen. Maybe you have issues, abuses, you're abusing certain things, but you don't want to admit to it. Yeah, you don't want to admit it. You know, <laughs> psychologists often say that it's a, that seeing them is still a stigma. People believe that. That somehow people if you are going to someone for help on something, they see it as a weakness. And sometimes we carry that in even into our theological lives. That somehow admitting to God what he already knows, sometimes your spouse knows already, but ain't telling you, you know it, Jack, like you don't. It's a form of weakness. You, you, you got some substance abuse problems? Lord, I want to thank you for the strength. <laughs> Getting through the day, you know, you're skipping over everything, right? You're skipping over everything, right? You spend half the day drinking yourself to, to I don't know what, you, could, you couldn't control it, right? Yeah, I'm talking about abuse, you couldn't control it. You come to, you, oh Lord, thank you, get me through. Why don't you be straight with him? It's not like he doesn't know. It's in the bedroom chamber. Now, none of us may know, and not every time we have to know. I tell you, transparency is overrated. I tell you, I know you don't like that. Ah, uh, yes, until we want to find out everything about your life. Can we find out everything about your life? Can you be changed? No, that's right, thank you. The young person speaks the truth. Yeah, they tell you straight. No, you can't. You cannot. We want it, but no business is fully transparent. In my opinion, it's not happening. No government's going to be fully transparent. I don't even think we can handle it. They talk about the president, they, you know how they talk about how the president gets aged? I think the president be knowing stuff. Stuff that he may not have wanted to know. 
Yeah. He said, I wish I was a still a citizen. Because he's, he has to continue, you know, when he's, when he's gone. He still gets briefing. Yeah. Yeah, and they say, they'll shape you up. You do a lot of talking on the campaign trail. But when you get there and you start finding out stuff, oh man, this is. Turn your hair gray. <laughs> Turn the hair gray, right? One year is a bullet unless you die it. Still die it. I don't know how mad this is gone. Let's clear. Do we want to know everything? No, sir. Pastor, I'm going to be a member of yours and I'm going to be transparent. You can always kind of, oh, really? <laughs> I'm going to know everything, right? Yes. You don't need to know everything on my cell phone. You don't need everything on my computer. You don't need to know everything I say in my bedroom, you don't need to know. Transparency, there's a level that we need. Yes, there's a working level, that's where discussion comes in. But I personally think it's overrated. You don't want to know everything. And I don't want to know everything either. But God knows it all. And so when you approach someone who knows it all, that's where, that's where the table, that's where the table turns, that's where it turns. That's where you can be straight with him. And I'm saying if you're straight with God in the bedroom chamber, uh, when you walk out into the living room, uh, there's a difference. Hallelujah. Yeah, when you're in the bedroom in the closet yes. and, you're, and, you, and you're straight with God, yes. I think lying to God is what eats people up yes. oftentimes inside. And they're still mad and angry like the devil themselves. Still mad and angry because they're battling with issues yes. that is affecting their constitution, their ethic. They can't tell anybody. Yes, and I'll tell you, even if you just want to go to a therapist, tell them. But I want you to know that God is, God, God, God is giving people gifts. Therapists, they have gifts. They know they do. Sometimes a good friend, they all have gifts. There, God uses people in this terrible life. But please don't forget that God is that great God of love and compassion. Hallelujah. I know, we it sometimes our crazy theology, yeah, that's right, that keeps us away from telling the truth about God. Yeah. The crazy theology. We don't want God to know like he don't know. And you got some crazy theology. And so, you, so to you, the way you cope is that, well, I won't say it, although I believe it. Because if I don't say it and God really doesn't know, then he can't get mad. Ergo, I'm still saved. Oh, my goodness. What? What kind of nonsense and logic was that? Salvation and all of God's promises have nothing to do with mankind. I'm amazed how we all know I'm saved by faith. You're not saved by faith. Texan said, you're saved by grace. Yes, it is exclusively, it is exclusively God's business. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes. We thank God. And, and what, I'm, what I'm saying is when we understand, just like the king of Syria understood, took him, it, took, it took a hard enough, but he began to understand that God is universal. When we understand that, this is what it does. It gives, it makes us, I think, more humble. Makes us more humble. Well, we understand that God is universal. That he knows even the deepest thoughts. It's, you know, the prophet Jeremiah says the heart is desperately wicked. That it will even deceive ourselves. Deceive us. That's amazing. And, and you know, when we talk about the heart, it's all about the mind. It's amazing that he would make that statement. That your mind can be so bad. You could be saying so much crazy stuff that you actually deceive yourself. <laughs> so much so that the New Testament says that the Spirit will take our prayers. Look, you don't, we don't even pray right. The Spirit will take our prayers and then shoot it up to God. Look at that's, that's God still getting involved. Because sometimes we don't even know what to say or how to say it. And we deceive. Oh, I think I want this. You deceive and it's, it's bad. It's bad. But we get a little more humble when we understand that God is universal. Yeah, he's universal. He knows. He knows. And watch this now. The final point is it puts in a greater perspective God's mercy and love. Yes, it does. Yes. Yes. Some people, some people accept God's mercy and love through a filter. The filter is they think some crazy way that God isn't, he isn't really taking into account how I really feel. So he's merciful. Oh, God, thank you for your mercy. Thank you so much for your love, right? But when we understand that he's universal, he penetrates even the, de the deceit of our heart. He penetrates it. He reads it like an open book. When we understand that, then yes. we understand greater is love and mercy. Hallelujah. Because he, when, when they talk about wretchedness, right, uh, you know, God, through God, you know, I don't, uh, wretchedness is a word that we use to, to, make, an, to make a point. I'm not saying the mankind is wretched and all that. I don't know that we say that, you know, but I, in, in songs, it's, it's to make a point. 
this wretchedness in us. God sees it. Yeah. Yeah. Sees it, knows it. And when you recognize that he knows that, not only will it humble, I think, yes, it will. but then it gives a very good perspective how much mercy he actually has. Hallelujah. How much love for me he actually has. Right. Yes, 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 yes. And hopefully, just a little bit of that can chip off to us as we deal with each other yes. Yes. interpersonally. That's the hope. In this temple life, until he comes again and works right every wrong and makes us immoral, incorruptible. Just a little bit. Yes. Just a little bit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You don't always know what people are going through, and you may not always have to know. Right. You know, people always make note that they come in a happy Sabbath and they smile, but something's not right. Well, that's fine. I don't say that's a bad thing. I mean, you can't come in and someone says happy Sabbath and you begin to tell them the hour of what's going on in your life. You could do that if you want to. Or you could say a oh, happy Sabbath and you smile back in as in polite society and you wait for the proper moment to really. Tell someone your, your, your thing. I don't, think it, I don't think it's bad. But it does point out. It does point out that you don't know what people are going through. Yeah, no, you, you, don't, you don't know. You don't know. Because not everyone is going to be as transparent as perhaps you would like them to be. And so, as humans, we don't have that ability to like God. So we try our best to still treat people in, in good ways. You know, trying to be available for them, you know. I'm, I'm here if you, if you want to talk, etc., etc. That's how the temple life. But for those who are really clinging to that eternal theological truth, know that. That God, he knows your stuff. Amen. And after knowing that, these statements are still true. After knowing all of that, these statements are still true. That he came to seek and save those that are lost. Yes. That grace is given to mankind. Yes. That God's a greater savior than we are sinners. Yes. Any yes. phrase you want to put, it's true. And you, and you want to get to that after you recognize that he knows everything. Yes. Yeah, he knows everything. Yes. He knows everything. That's the risk he takes. That's the risk he takes. Yeah. He knew He knew not everybody's going to accept Paul's gospel. Oh, he knew that. Yes. He knew that. I wonder if I'd even accept it. You killing off Christians, now you want to come up and talk about you born again? <laughs> wow. Are you really born again? Hallelujah. You heard of all the people you kill? Now you want to tell me about the significance of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? Well, I, I believe that. Listen, 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 listen. <laughs> you remember how the slaves would hear about Jesus by their slave masters? And some did not want to have anything to do with it. Because their concept was, how is it that you're telling me this, and look what you're doing? Uh -huh. Right. That blocking. That's how people were with, with, with Paul. Really? Yeah. It's a risk. It's a risk. God, he took it. And after him knowing all of that, salvation was still given to Paul. Still that way. Oh, God can't do that. Well, then let's examine you. <laughs> okay, so now so let's examine you in your life. Your secret thoughts. Mm. Yeah. Right. And then you recognize, well, amen. God's a good God. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. Switch that. God's good. Thank you. Thank you. So be strong. In this week, I know we have our prayer group. I think our prayer group will be down there at, uh, I know, you know, down there. There's a prayer wall down there at Priscilla's, uh, Priscilla's thing going on there in Oakland. There's a prayer wall. And, and uh, she talked to me about it uh, last week. Listen, in our prayer life, whether it's intercessory or not, my challenge to you today is to just be honest with him. Go to your bed chamber. If you tell your spouse you need some time, you don't need to hear this, honey. Because I'm about to talk about you. <laughs> you don't need to hear this right now. You go on and have fun and do that. I'm going to be alone. You don't tell him, but you tell God. Yeah, you can tell God. You can tell him. Tell him. Tell him. Tell him. Or her. Wait, wait, so wait. Tell him. Right. Tell God. Right. Or, or yes, or yes. The male or the female. That, that's the thing. Yes. Okay. The male. Or tell God. That's right. That's right. That's right. You know, it's, you know, it's not always it's not male bashing. You know? <laughs> it's always the man. You know, something wrong with you. Yeah. <laughs> Whichever one you you tell God. You tell him. 
And that's my challenge to you. Increase in your spiritual life in prayer. Tell him and be truthful. Use the language that you have. You don't have to borrow language from the pastor and all this. Oh, dear God, who breaketh, who seeth everything and sitteth height. And he's doing this in the old? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, cut that out. You go straight to him. Say what you got to say. That's the push now. Yeah, That's the push for our prayer life. And, my, and I believe, and I want, I want to hear your testimonies, I want to hear your testimony, and I believe that God will respond in kind and that the burdens will be lifted in a more powerful way. Yes. When you get up off your knees or whatever your prayer posture is, it will be lifted because you were honest with God and with man. Because yeah. prayer is not for God, it's for us. That's right. Yeah. You were honest with him. And there you know God is working it out. How many of you believe the word of God? Amen. Amen. You got to know it. Don't be like the king of Syria trying to figure out what's going on. Thinking God is only in a limited place. Be like Elisha in Israel. He's everywhere. We know it. And we thank him for that. Father, I want to speak this blessing. I want to speak this blessing to all on the sound of my voice. <laughs> that they may grow even to the next rung of their spiritual life. In prayer, by trying to get even more honest with you. Whatever language they have to use. Yes, whatever language they have to use. Not like you can't read it already. They use it and they talk to you even about things that maybe it's uncomfortable. But it's not, it's not like you don't know. That father is a, we see it in David, is a step forward in our prayer life. And in this temporal life, the things that go on around us, we need that. We need as much temporal spiritual power as possible. And that's the extra step, Father. So I want to challenge those on the sound of my voice to do that for this week. We have prayer and testimony coming up. I believe it is in April. And there, Father, if not before, people who have testimony about how you have really increased their spirit's life. Because of their honesty, we want to hear that. So I speak this, Father, and I speak it in the name of Jesus. We know all good things that's coming from eternity, from the eternal realm, it comes from you. Same thing as the temple, it comes from you, and it is your business alone. Sometimes that crazy theology that we have something to do with it, Father, it messes us up, messes, makes us act and think ways that we know is not honest. It's not how we really are. It's all in you. You did it knowing how we really are. We want to thank you for that. I give this prayer in the name of Jesus who makes all things well, who Paul says that all of God's promises are yes and amen in him. I want to give this prayer in that name. The name is Jesus. He is our Christ. Amen. 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 Strong and of good courage.